Hello, and welcome to worship at Park Place Christian Church. We are so honored that you are worshiping with us on this fourth Sunday or this fourth week of Advent. We hope that your Advent journey has been filled with so much joy and music and life as we journey to the birth of our Savior. As we begin our worship, let us take a moment and center ourselves and light candles to remind us of Christ's presence here with us as we worship together. The great light prophesied by Isaiah in today's text is echoed in the first strains of the Gospel of John. Good news, the light that brings peace, that saves the people from all that would extinguish it, has been there since the beginning. The word is made flesh and dwells among us. This reign is now. Will we believe it? Will we continue to put flesh on it, embodying this peace meant for all humanity? of your gift of peace on earth, even in the midst of fear, of challenge, of struggle, even when we aren't sure that goodwill among us can be found, ignite the flame of peace within us that we might glow with its brilliance from the inside out. light the fourth Advent candle, the candle of peace at this time.
This Advent season, we are inviting those who are young or who have ever been young to learn how to sign this little light of mine as our um, time to reflect and to remember that um, no matter what is facing us, that uh, God's light shines through us and that we should let it shine. Um, and this song has been a song that Christians have sung in all kinds of situations. And so may we, during these strange and turbulent times, sing it or sign it um, as our refrain. I will review all of our previous weeks. And so if you're like me and don't always remember, or if you're new, um, you can catch up with us. And then we will learn our last verse. So if you remember... Um, it's this little light, like a candle, of mine with our hand flat against our chest. So this little light of mine, and then your finger to your um, pointer finger at yourself, I, and then you're going to do your hands from up to down. I'm going to let it shine, and you can decide if you want to let your light shine or let your light shine. Um, you can, and then we're going to hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Uh, we are going to uh, don't let no one blow it out. We're going to let it shine. Uh, and our final today is all around the world. I'm going to let it shine. So all is kind of an interesting sign. You're going to start with the two, your hands back to back, and then you're going to take it around. So all, and then you're going to be um, the back of your hand to the palm of your hand. All, around, and then world, you're going to make a W with both hands, three fingers up, and take it around. All around the world, I'm going to let it shine. Again, all around the world, I'm going to let it shine. And a third time, all around the world, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let us put it all together and let our light shine with the help of Sandy on piano and Alice singing for us today. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Don't let no one blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let no one blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let no one blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. All around the world, I'm gonna let it shine. All around the world, I'm gonna let it shine. All around the world, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Amen. We hope that you let your light shine 
and that you don't let the fear of singing keep you from singing and maybe just with your hands when you're around others. Let us go to God as we hear a word from Scripture, the Gospel of John this week. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God, who were born not of flesh or of the will of flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Let us together turn our hearts, <coughs> excuse me, turn our hearts to God in prayer this day. Gracious God, from whom we receive the gift of life, in whom we learn the meaning of life, and to whom we owe the glory of life, we praise your holy name. We praise you for Jesus who embodied human life so that we might embody divine life. We remember the story of Jesus' birth. Deep darkness covered the world, yet a light shone in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. And yet, the violent don't abandon their weapons in this day. Those who have heavy ambitions don't drop them. The wealthy don't share their possessions. The powerful don't honor their positions. But your light is shining in the darkness so that bankruptcy and violence, so that poverty, so that all things can be revealed. Oh God, we pray that we, your people, who have seen your light, can walk among the shadows and bring light to the dark places in this world. Lord, there have been so many times where we have betrayed your will, where we have done things that we wish you didn't know about, but you know all things. We, none of us, can plead innocent. But we know that you forgive all. We know 
that you love us. We know that there is nothing we can ever do or say that will separate us from your love, your grace, and your forgiveness. And we are eternally grateful for that. Oh God, this Advent, this Christmas, may the light that shone in Bethlehem all those years ago shine in our world May it shine through our actions and through our words. Lord, this world, this 21st century world is awaiting the Savior that was born Christmas Day many years ago. May we experience it as we move about your creation, as we move about those who are sick and hurting. May we remember those who need our prayers in this quiet moments. Oh Lord, we pray for these people and we lift our voices, praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. During this worship series, we have called upon the power of sung poetry that inspires those who hear it for a brighter tomorrow. It has been a difficult time in this pandemic to not sing with one another. In the absence of hearing one another sing, we are reminded just how important it is to raise our voices and praise God together. Indeed, music has been the soundtrack of hope so many times. Our choir and our tech director, Mike, have worked hard to put together a virtual anthem that, as we conclude our Advent series. Someday, we will be able to join our voices again in song here in our sanctuary. But for now, rather than turning away from music and sorrow, we turn toward the story of music to deepen our appreciation of its role in healing, change, and reconciliation. This week, we present to you the theme anthem for this series that features poetry from an anonymous Jewish person during the Holocaust. These words were found um, on a wall and have now been shared with the world, reminding us of the resilience of hope. May we never forget what can happen when evil is allowed to go unchecked, that we may always use music, our art, our poetry, and even simple acts of kindness as inspiration to create goodness, not evil, in our world. I believe in the sun, I believe in the sun, even when, even when it's not shined. I believe in the sun. So 
days away from Christmas. Can you believe that? Let's say where has the time gone? We now enter the fourth Sunday of Advent. Some of you have said, well, where have you been? The holidays have been going on for some time now. Some people have said, well, come Thanksgiving, the holiday season begins. Others have said, no, no, it begins at Halloween, Halloween, then Thanksgiving, then Christmas, then New Year's. Others have said, au contraire. Actually, the preparation in beginning the walk to Christmas begins in July. Now, I say that because some of you who are crafters know that if you walk into some of your craft stores, you will begin to see Christmas things lining the shelves by July. And I remember saying, how can that be? How, how are people doing this so early? Until somebody said, well, if you're a crafter, you have all this time to create your things to be ready for Christmas. So people have been getting ready for Christmas, some of them, for maybe the past six months. Others who have said, well, I don't usually do anything Christmassy until after Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is that holiday that seems to always be left out of things. But they said, but this year with this pandemic, I have needed that sense of, of joy. I, I need some sense of hope. And so we've put our things up a little earlier than what we would typically do. Others have said, well, throughout this pandemic, it's, it's something where I, I, I've needed to see some kind of bright lights and trees and, and wreaths and berries, and, and I've needed to see some or taste some eggnog and sugar cookies and candy canes, and oh, still others who are joyful and hopeful for the season, there are those who are not so joyful or hopeful. Some of those who complain through the season and say, we can't even enjoy our Thanksgiving dinner because now even Cyber Monday has been moved to Thursday. And then for the next week or so, we're being tempted by consumerism to get in on that deal before it's gone. And others have said, listen, I need such hope this year I'm even willing to have the dysfunctional families come together just so we could be together. We want to we wanna just be together. We are rushed. We are broke. We are tired. We are anxious. And of course we are weary, especially this year. Maybe it's a really good time for us to be looking at the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is a little bit different gospel than the other three. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic gospels, which is a fancy way of saying they're similar. John, however, is not like those other gospels. John uses a lot more imagery. In John, you won't find any stories about the birth of Jesus or Mary or the sheep or the shepherds or, or any of those kinds of things. But what John is going to tell you right out of the gate, in the very first words of his gospel, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. He was God in the beginning. So John is being very clever here because John is speaking to two very different groups of people and sharing a message in such a way that both diverse groups are going to understand this message. Which is why it's really great for us today, because despite all of our distractions, people, presence, and personalities, we too are people who need to hear and be redirected and refocused to the greatest gift 
that will be given to us in the birth of Christ. You see, John's gospel is speaking to the Greeks. Now, the Greeks in his day were people who were very sophisticated people, but when John uses the, the verbiage of the word, they understand that word meaning logos. And when speaking of logos, that's where we get the word logic. And so for them, reasoning and logic are really important to them. And they, they were the kind of people who wanted to understand life. What's the meaning of life? What's the purpose of life? What is the logos? Aristotle said, the logos is a mysterious force. It tells us what's right and what's wrong, what's good, what's evil, what's helpful, what's harmful. But even in the Greek culture of his day, people trying to come up with the answer of understanding what's the purpose and meaning of life and what does all of this mean anyway, there were two groups of people in that. One group is called the Epicuritans. Now the Epicuritans were people who, who said, you know, here's the deal. We're not ever going to come up with the answer of what's the purpose of life, so just eat, drink, and be merry. You're going to die anyway, so just enjoy whatever life you have. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it. Don't stress yourself. Then there, there were the Stoics. And the Stoics said, well, I, I know we may not come up with the answer of the meaning of life, but it seems like as we live in this world, we should at least live a moral life and maybe leave it in a little better place than when we found it. Kind of reminds me of Girl Scouts. <laughs> Wherever we went, it was always the Girl Scout rule, leave it in a better place than when you found it. But then if you think about it today, how many of us have maybe adopted some of that way of thinking? I mean, after all, you'll have one group of people say, look, it's all about me, 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 me first. We're instructed when we go on an airplane, if the airplane's going to go down, put your mask on first, then you help somebody else. We're kind of ingrained with that. If I don't take care of me, nobody else will. And we have that sense of let's leave things nicer than we found it. But logos that John is speaking to in this group of people is not just about the purpose of life, but that he has found the answer to this question for them. There's also the Jewish community. Now in the Jewish community, as John opens up his gospel to say, in the beginning was the word, a good Jew is going to immediately come back to the book of Moses. Book of Moses is the first five books of the Old Testament. What's in Genesis 1? In the beginning. In the beginning, it's about God creating the world with the word. And so the Jewish people, as they hear John speak about this, they immediately think about, I understand this God you're talking about. This is the God who has followed us throughout our whole life. And so here's these two groups of people trying to understand the meaning of life and another group of people saying, God is with you. God has always been with you. But let me tell you in this moment, that in the story of who this Jesus is, he was in the beginning. And the word used for the, the verb used in this in the beginning means before time. Has always been, was with you, and will always be. John goes on to describe that in the beginning was God, the Word was God, the Word was with God. But the purpose of his book is seen in verse 14 to say, He came and dwelt among us in the flesh. He was here. God came in the flesh and dwelt 
among us, this God from all eternity who has been with us before time began, who walked the earth with us in life and who continues to live throughout eternity, this God came into humanity and shared with humanity, I am the light and the life and I give you meaning, and I give you purpose. And when he talks about life, he doesn't mean biology life. The verb he uses is zoa, 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 which means spiritual life. He comes to bring for us a spiritual life, something that is so much more. So as these listeners are hearing this message, it is a message that transcends time and is such an appropriate message for us today. We have lived through one of the hardest years of our lives. We have seen this virus take hold of not just our country, but the world. Not just our friends, but our families. There has been questions about what does all this mean? We see a loved one die and it can't help but bring up for us what's the meaning of life? What is my life about? What if I die tomorrow? What if? John says there is one who has coming, who's always been here. In the midst of our anxiety, in the midst of our struggle, there is one who is here to bring us peace, to uplift our hope, to love us, and to bring joy. So, when is the last time you asked yourself or maybe had a conversation with somebody else and said, what's the meaning of your life? I dare say, as I try to recall in my own life, how many conversations have I had like that, and I'll have to say, very few. It's a little bit scary to talk about that. What is the meaning of my life? I, you'll hear some people say, well, I don't know. But some things happen in our life, and, and if it requires change, if, if the way I'm living my life now is anxious, then that's a pretty good indicator that I've taken the reins from Jesus, and I've said, thanks, but no thanks. I want to handle this problem all by myself. I don't need you. And then we wonder why we're depressed or we're anxious or unhappy. Could it be? that as we look into the light and life of who Jesus is and put ourselves up against that, do we see something we don't really want to see? Oh, if I had to compare myself with Jesus. But we do that. We go on living our lives off course until something slaps us back into reality. How hard is it when you try to get into a ride at the amusement park and the ride bar won't go over your stomach because it's too big? That we're alerted there might be something wrong. Or how many times have we ever decided I can do this myself, I don't need your help? It's Close to Christmas, how many of you try to put a bicycle together and you say, I don't need anybody's help, I can do this, and I get the directions out, and I'm as lost as can be. Or I've put it all together and there's a screw still sitting on the floor. I don't need anybody's help. But then when I do it, something isn't right. Right. 
how hard it is to look in the mirror at ourselves and some of us just decide not to look at all because who we see looking back at us isn't the one whom Christ wishes us to be. We don't like change. We don't, we're afraid of change because change means that I have to look into a place where I can't see where my next step is going to be. You're asking me to trust you, God. You want me to walk into the darkness, but I don't know if I'm going to walk into the wall or, or off of the cliff. Or You want me to trust you, and honestly, God, I, I'd rather see the light from my switch and not the light from you. Many of us know that change only comes when we hurt enough. If I put my hand on the burning oven, I will leave it there until I can't stand the pain anymore, and then I will take my finger off. We do that in life. We put up and tolerate things that, yes, it hurts, but it doesn't hurt enough to make me change to where I'm willing to walk into the darkness and allow Jesus to lead me. In this Advent season, we have been talking about what does it mean to walk through this season in trusting God who says, I have come so that you might live And the way that you live is not to have more money or not have a better relationship or not have the best looks. That all fades. But I have come so that you can clean your life and be fresh and new for what I'm about to do in your life. It requires you to trust me. It is scary. I can't imagine what it had to have been like for Mary to be this teenager who would already have been stoned to death had not Joseph taken the high road, had not the angel Gabriel come to assure them, yes, you can be looked at as an outcast because you're pregnant. Everybody knows you're betrothed. You're not married yet, and yet you're walking around pregnant. But she did it anyway because she trusted She is the vehicle through which new life and power comes into the world. It's interesting, as we have moved through this season, to know that all through this journey, we have been asked to focus on the light, on the peace, the joy, the hope, the love. John is making a case like before a jury to say to them, I want you to believe this message because it's true. Believe this message that life has a Savior who is willing and who has come to be a part of your life, who wants to be in your life, who wants to guide your life. And all it takes is for us to hear the story, to believe the story to hear its truth and to know that no matter what happens in our lives, be it a coronavirus, be it anything that happens in our life, we are never, ever left alone. But there is one who has come to carry us, to love us, to be the answer to our hope to bring us joy. All we need to do is believe and receive.
Amen. It is always a special time in the life of our worship to come around a table. I used to be what they called a senator in my dorm in college. The senator's job was to kind of keep everybody on the floor excited, engaged. And the only way we could really get anybody to show up for the meetings was to order from the kitchen a half a sheet of cake. So as long as there was food, people would show up. Well, we come to this meal every week. We have a meal every time. There's food here all the time. And that food is what draws us together, not only in worship, but also in love. So Jesus, when he was getting ready to leave. He wanted to leave his disciples a symbol, something that they could hang on to and be reminded of his love and his sacrifice for them. He wanted to make the way smooth for us. And so he took a simple loaf of bread and as he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat this is my body broken for you that you might in taking it remember remember me likewise he took the cup again a common drink and as he shared it with his disciples around the table he shared it to remind them to love all of you or require the sacrifice of my blood. I could get out of it, but I won't. Because I know that the cost is too great if I don't, for you, save your life. And so they drank it together, and for every meal after remembered this is a meal to remember that we're all part of the body of Christ. And when we take this meal together apart, we are still one body gathered together wherever we are. Won't you join me? We know that as we are gathering for our fourth Sunday in Advent, still hard to believe, what an amazing time in the life of the church, in, in our own lives, to say to Jesus Christ, I give my life to you. You gave so much for us that I want to give my life to you. If you want to give your life to Jesus, you're invited to just say, Jesus, come into my life. And then let us know about that so we can have a prayer with you and talk to you about your journey. One of the ways that we give to the church, give back to Jesus, is by also giving of our money, our talents, our time. For the last two weeks, we have, been, we have a special offering that is uh, our Christmas offering. It comes to us that this particular offering serves our region, the Southwest region, when you give extra ties or money to the region, you're doing it for a variety of ministries that the region provides for us. It connects congregations to one another. It fosters faith development. It gathers disciples in camps, conferences, and assemblies. It nurtures uh, the development of new generations of pastors. It assists churches in calling new ministers. 
It interprets the global mission of the church. It represents the church in ecumenical gatherings. It counsels and prays for those who are troubled in spirit. It leads the church to address racism. It inspires leaders to experiment and create. It's a witness to the power of God in making things new and so much more. Our region, especially during this time of COVID, has been hard at work in trying to not only pastor the pastors through all of this, but also to grow the church in spite of what's happening with this virus. So when you give, you give to the works of the bigger church beyond our local church so that the church can thrive wherever we are. And now let's hear a word in our benediction from Heather. In this season of waiting, know this. We wait for justice, but we do not wait to work for change. We wait for restored health, but we do not wait to work to heal. We wait for wholeness, but we do not wait to work at binding brokenness. We wait for peace, but we do not wait to eliminate hatred. And so, my friends, like bells ringing out the news, that light has dawned and shines on all people, fill the night left by sadness with messages of peace. Go into your lives humming tunes that keep peace alive in you and that spur you to work for justice and reconciliation. Raise your voices and repeat after me. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Amen.